Join me in the call to worship, which you can find printed in your bulletin, reading responsively. We come here shouting, our voices lifted in praise. We come here singing, our songs full of joy. We come here dancing, our hearts rejoicing. We come here We worship the one who is worthy. All praise and glory to God forevermore. Let us pray. This morning, God, we want everything to be for your glory. We want our thoughts, our words, our songs, our church, our community, our resources, our time, our lives, all to be for you. Everything ours is yours, and we come together to declare this to be so on this Sunday, your holy day. 
Bless our time together with your holy presence. Amen. Savior and our Lord. But if we come here only to add our joyful songs in praise, if we come here even just to hear the word of God read and proclaimed and sung in such a beautiful way, if we come to do all of this but we do not pause to confess that we fall short, we fall short of who it is God calls us to be and we fall short of what it is that God calls us to do. And if we do not confess this, then friends, we lie to ourselves, we lie to each other, we lie to our God. And the truth, it isn't in us. But if we will confess our sins, our God, who is faithful and true, will forgive us every sin. And so, friends, with faith, we turn our hearts to God in prayer, first using our printed prayer of confession that you will find in our bulletin, and then in a time of silence. Let us pray. God of mercy and of love, we know that sometimes we allow ourselves to be distracted by things that really don't matter all that much. We would rather pursue intellectual arguments than live the gospel. We would rather debate our equals than defend the vulnerable. We prefer to think about you instead of getting to know you. Forgive us, God. Help us to open our hearts wide in love and in grace, and so be living examples of your good news. In Christ we pray.
Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news, the only news that really matters. We are forgiven by a God who looks at us and sings joyful, joyful, even when we know we do not deserve it. Friends, look at each other and know that we each are a part of God's beloved people. Know that whatever it is we have done to fall short this week, we are forgiven and be at peace. Let us pray. Loving God, you promised in the scriptures that your word will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May it be so today. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading comes from Psalm 150 and can be found on page 583 in the Old Testament of your pew Bibles. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with a lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite our disciples to come down. That doesn't want me. You can sit right there. I bet you can still fit. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. So, we heard a psalm read this morning. And our psalms, some of our psalms are psalms of joy and of praise. And sometimes our psalms are harder psalms. Because our psalms are poems in the Bible that were meant to be sung in church. Which is pretty fun. So, our psalm today talks about all the different ways that we should worship. Did you hear anything in the psalm about how we can worship we can worship with different things so we heard about we could worship with symbols you guys ever seen symbols when a band plays and with lutes do you know what a lute is oh it's a stringed instrument high five good job all sorts of different instruments that in in the in biblical time they could use to worship God and to say God we love you but do you all have a lute at your house no no. Hmm. Do you have a set of cymbals at your house? No drums. No, no drums at our house. Okay, so does that mean that we can't worship God? Oh, it doesn't. So let's look around here. Do we have any symbols in this church? Mm -hmm. Like the loud, we do have a, a, that kind of symbol. Very good. But do we have symbols that make a loud crashing noise? Uh, you wait. It's not really. Not really. Oh, do we have any lutes? Do you see any lutes in the church? Uh, oh, the piano is just swing instrument, but not a lute. Oh, very good. We do have some instruments, but we don't have lutes. So does that mean that we can't worship God the way the psalm tells us to? <gasps> no. So how do we worship in this sanctuary? Sing. Oh, we sing beautiful songs, and we have an organ, and next week we're going to have some handbells. But what are ways that we can worship God maybe that we don't need instruments for? Oh, 
my goodness. Hang on a second. Do you want to say that to the microphone so everybody can hear? That was a really good answer. What can we use? Our voice. We can use our voices. Our voices are wonderful ways that we can worship God. And we can worship God when we're here in this beautiful place that is made for worshiping God. But our psalmist reminds us we don't have to be in a church to worship God. Everywhere we go is a place where we can worship. So this week, when you're in a place that doesn't feel like it's a place made to worship God, I want you to stop and think about something you can do to let God know that you love God and do that in that time and place. Do you think we can do that this week? Maybe it's in the line in the grocery store or maybe it's in your least favorite class at school or maybe it's just when you're walking around your neighborhood. But let's think of a way outside of the box that we can let God know that we love God this week. Do you think we can do that? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Can we say a prayer together? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you give us beautiful spaces like the sanctuary to worship. We also thank you that you give us a whole awesome world that is just for us and where we can worship you every day. Help us to remember this week that every day and every place is a good one to worship you. Amen. Thanks, guys.
What a beautiful example we get every week of what it means to joyfully worship our God. Friends, our second scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the book of 2 Samuel. We will start in 2 Samuel chapter 5, reading verses 1 through 5, and then move to chapter 6 and read verses 1 through 5 there as well. Listen this morning for God's word to you. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your flesh and bone. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out and brought us in. The Lord said to you, It is you who should be the shepherd of my people Israel. You shall be the ruler over Israel. So all of the elders came together at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David as king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he began his reign, and he reigned for 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah six, seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all of Israel and Judah for 33 years. And David again gathered all of the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 of them together. David and all the people with him set out and went to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned on its cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinabad, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all of the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and with lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and with cymbals. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'll confess there are not a whole lot of times that I wish that we were a screen and video kind of church, but this morning might be one of them because it just feels wrong to read this story and not watch a little bit of Harrison Ford running after the lost ark. Because if we're honest, most of us know more about the ark from Indiana Jones than we do from anywhere else. <laughs> If we want to know more what the Bible tells us about the ark, we look to the 25th chapter of Exodus where Moses is on Mount Sinai, and in addition to the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, Moses brings down from the mountain a special place to hold those two tablets, a special box that is called the ark. I'll admit it's unfortunate that the ark, which is this box, has the same name as the boat that Noah runs it rides in, because I think we confuse the two of them an awful lot. This ark, this ark is a box made of acacia wood. It's about four feet long and it's two feet high. The chest is covered with gold. The lid is made of gold. And on the lid sit two cherubims, two angels, to remind us that between those angels, we find the presence of God. The ark at the time was considered to be the location, the place where you went to experience the living God among us and in our midst. 
And so for the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, the ark would go before the people every time they left a place and headed for another. When Joshua took the people across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the priests who were carrying the ark were the first ones who found themselves on the other side in the land that had been promised, the land flowing with milk and honey. But after the people entered the Promised Land, they sort of forgot about the ark which might happen to some of us as well. They got to the place where they had been promised that they would end up, a place that was good, a place that was full of plenty, a place where they didn't have to worry quite as much anymore. And the importance of this box, the importance of this place where they could go and feel like they were in the presence of God, began to be a little less important. The Philistines, in fact, took the ark for a little while, and the people of God didn't even really at first try very hard to get it back. It just didn't seem like it was much of a priority. Finally, the Philistines realized that if it didn't mean that much to the Israelites, then they didn't really want to keep it that much themselves. And so it ended up in the house of a priest, a house named, a priest named Abinadad. It was kept at his house for years, and no one really noticed it, and no one really worried about where it was. It was almost as if the people didn't worry so much anymore about finding God among them. And then in our story this morning, David decided he wanted to bring the ark into the city of Jerusalem. At the beginning of our story today, the first part that we read, David becomes the king of all Israel and makes Jerusalem the capital and decides to unify the kingdom in one place and in one time. By bringing the ark to Jerusalem, he felt like this was going to be his symbolic moment to say that they were all in this together and that indeed God was in their midst. And so we read that they had a little parade and they brought the ark into Jerusalem and there was a little bit of singing and a little bit of dancing and a little bit of worship went along with it. So each year in the four years of our narrative lectionary cycle, we get one week on David. There are so many stories out there on David. I will confess that when I first read that this is what we were the only story about David that we were reading this year, I was a little disappointed. Because nothing, it seems, really happens in this story. And there are so many other stories about David where a lot takes place. David takes five smooth stones as a tiny boy and defeats the giant Goliath. Which reminds us that even when we feel like we are tiny and we are up against insurmountable odds, that God can do amazing things through us. But we don't get to read this year about David and Goliath. As the youngest of the brothers, he is chosen to be king over all of his brothers, even though his older brothers, to be real honest, were better choices than he was. He was the last and the least obvious choice. All of his older brothers are bigger and they're stronger and they're more popular and they speak better, yet he is the one that God chooses to be king. Which reminds us that even when we don't see greatness in ourselves, thanks be to God, God sees greatness in each and every one of us. God always does. And so when we look in the mirror, we should see a person that God knows is special. And that when we look at other people, we should see a person that we know God thinks is special too. 
But we aren't reading today about David and being chosen against all odds. It's even true that not all of the stories we have about David are stories about David being a paradigm of obedience and of goodness. He stands on his roof and his eye is caught by Bathsheba and he wants her and he takes her. Which makes us uncomfortable because sometimes we too see what we want and we take it without much thought for what that might do to someone else. And then when Bathsheba becomes pregnant and all of a sudden there are going to be consequences to David's actions, David does even worse to run away from the responsibility that he has for his actions. Which makes us momentarily feel a little bit better because at least we have never had someone killed to cover and then our pride and our arrogance starts tiptoeing back that maybe we also have done some bad things as well. And then David has to stand before his friend Nathan and comes face to face with what he has done and confesses. Which makes us realize that like David, we too are the man and we have screwed up and continue to screw up by comparing what we have done and what we have not done to what others have done and have not done. But we aren't reading that story either. And even just a few chapters after this, there is action around the ark. David dances with abandon before the Lord. His family is embarrassed at how wildly he is worshiping. And there might even be some implication that in his, in his excitement about worship that he might have left his clothing somewhere else. And he might have shown a little more than he did. And he is so excited to be dancing before God. And we are encouraged even as Presbyterians to let loose just a little bit when it comes to worshiping our God. But maybe not quite as much as David did in that story but even today we are not even reading about David dancing with abandon in our story today the people come to David and say you know you've basically been acting like our king for years now so why don't we go ahead and make it official and David says okay that works for me and so David is the king and then he and his band of merry musicians sing and play a little ditty as they carry a box into Jerusalem. The narrative lectionary, I think, is fun to preach because true to his name, it's about narrative. And yet today, our narrative seems fairly weak. Even if we just go a couple of verses later, there is a little more action because the ox that is pulling the ark stumbles and the ark wobbles and Uzzah puts up his hand to balance it so it doesn't fall over and he is struck dead by God for what he does. And we don't really like it and we don't really understand it, but there's something that happens in this story. And yet that's not part of the story we are told to preach this morning. I'll admit some of the resources that I read this week encouraged expanding this story to include that, just to make the, story, the scripture reading this morning a little bit punchier. But I was hesitant to do so, because I think we do that too often in life. It doesn't seem like anything too important is happening right now, and so we just write it off. A few years ago, there was an article in the New York Times, or in the New Yorker, called The Busy Trap. It's one I have saved on my computer and read again every year or so. Because it talks about how we are pulled towards this notion of being busy. It marks importance to us when we can say, oh, I'm just too busy to do that right now. It means we are worth more. It means that our time is worth more because there is so much that we have to do. And we take that mark of busy as an act of pride. And it's kind of how I felt when I read this passage. It just isn't busy enough to feel like it matters. 
It just isn't busy enough to feel like it is important. It just isn't busy enough to make us think it is worth taking note. But maybe, just maybe, the fact that it isn't busy is exactly what we need. Because what does David do when he becomes king and unifies the kingdom and gives the people and presumably God everything that they have been asking for for generations? He stops and he worships. And nothing else. It's a good reminder to us that stopping and worshiping, while it may not seem busy, while it may not seem all that important, indeed is what we, as the people of God, are called to. Today's a good reminder that our understanding is that David, who we read about in our story today, is also the fellow who wrote at least some of the Psalms that we find in our Bible. And most likely, we believe, wrote the psalm that we read just a little while ago. The psalmist instructs us to praise God in the sanctuary, to praise God in the mighty heavens. First of all, the psalmist reminds us you should praise God in the temple, in the one place that is designated among all of the places where God is to be worshipped. We must be a worshiping people, the psalmist tells us. Not just that, we should praise God in the mighty heavens. Praise God wherever it is you find yourself. You do not have to be in the temple. You do not have to be in the sanctuary. You can be at the lake or on the golf course or even just on a walk through your neighborhood. There, the psalmist reminds us, we are called to praise our God. We are called to praise God, our psalmist tells us, for what God has done. David indeed praises God for unifying the kingdom, for delivering them from their enemies. When we praise God, we give thanks for all of the things that God has done in our life, for all of the things we can identify that God has done to make our lives better. But even more so, maybe, the psalmist reminds us today that we are to praise God not for what God has done, but for who God is. We praise God, the psalmist reminds us, for God's surpassing greatness. And that sometimes is harder for us to do. It's easy to become so enthralled with looking at what God is doing around us and praising God for actions that we can identify and forget that even when things are not busy, that we still have a God who loves us, who is guiding us, who is guarding us, who is protecting us, who is worthy to be praised. It doesn't seem like much, this reading that we have today. And some Sundays it doesn't seem like much to be sitting here in this sanctuary compared to all of the other things that maybe we could do with our time. But as we trace this fall, looking at what it is we have to learn from the ancestors of our faith, let us remember that we are called to be a little more like David. Not fighting Goliath or becoming the king, certainly not in having his eye on Bathsheba, or even later when he is willing to take responsibility for his actions. Be like David. Remember that worship indeed is as important as all of those other things that we do. Worshiping here with your church family, but also worshiping out in the world. Remembering to praise God in everything and for everything. 
Worship God for what God has done for you, but worship God also simply for who God is. Worship God with all that you are, with all that you have, because all that we are and all that we have indeed is from our God. Amen. As we remain standing, let us say that which we believe, using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The God of heaven and earth and of all creation holds each one of us in tender love and care. We respond to God by offering a portion of what we have graciously received. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
Let us pray. God, you have given each of us gifts to use as members of the body of Christ. Here are our gifts, the work of our hands, our hearts, and our lives. We pray that they may help to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our world, today and always, here and everywhere. Amen. You may be seated. Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? Lord God, giver of all good gifts, there is so much for which we give thanks to you today. For the morning air that awakens our lungs, for the sunset in the evening which tells us that day is done, and for all the moments in between, moments of pain and moments of happiness, moments of grace and moments of defeat. For all of this, O oh God, we give thanks to you. As we sit in this sanctuary surrounded by family and friends, we thank you, God, for your gift of the church. In so many ways, we are blessed. The beauty of the sanctuary in which we worship this morning is eclipsed only by the beauty of the souls who find their home in its pews. It is within the bounds of this body that our laughter is shared and our tears are dried. It is within the bounds of this body that our concerns are lifted on the wings of prayers and our children are taught the stories of your love. Remind us of how blessed we are to be a part of this small corner of your kingdom. And remind us of what an awesome responsibility we have for its life. Loving God, it is hard some days not to be overwhelmed by the needs we see in your world. Children who live without food, children who live without love, families who cannot make their relationships work, families who cannot make ends meet, soldiers who die far from home, soldiers who come home and can't ever start over. And then we watch the news, O oh God, and we see the images of violence, the images of warfare, the images of suffering, the images of your children everywhere in your world who need peace, who need more grace, who need more love. There are so many people, O oh God, who are hurting. People we love, people we know, people whose stories we can't even imagine because they are so distant from our own. And it's hard to understand sometimes why such unthinkable things happen in this world that you created. Remind us, God, that you are there. Let our prayers for others bring them comfort. Let our prayers for others bring you joy. Let our prayers for others bring us faith and a closer relationship with you. And may our prayers for others be answered by the actions you send us out in the world to do. We pray these things and many more in the strong name of Jesus, the one who came to save and the one who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, we go from this place today into a world where if we are honest, we will admit there are a lot of things happen that do not make us want to scream out how great it is. But we go into a world where we find our God and who is always great and always worthy to be praised. And so we go with a song of praise in our hearts, even if our world is not filled with praise itself. Not always an easy thing to do. But friends, we are called to do hard things. And we are called to do hard things because our God is with us. And so we go remembering this week as we do each and every Sunday that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit all are with us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen.